In a cold, dark prison cell, a man bends his frail knees, puts his hands together, and begins to pray. He is hungry, tired, weak from malnutrition. He has been beaten and forced to suffer for his beliefs. And yet, he is thankful to be where he is, more than 7,000 miles from his place of birth. His captors have repeatedly tried to humiliate him and get him to renounce his God, but he will not do that. His heart and mind are at peace. Nonetheless, after more than a year inside his cell, the man will die alone. The man's name is Francis Xavier Ford. Was he a martyr? Is he a saint? How should we remember this man of God? Father James Anthony Walsh, back in the very beginning of Mary Knoll, wanted the United States Church to be making a contribution to the universal mission of the church in the world. At that point, the United States was still pretty much considered a mission territory. But we were a growing church, and he thought it was time that we began to make a contribution. The bell rings. The heart quickens as friends and relatives gather. Young soldiers of Christ prepare to join the 65,000 Catholic missioners already in the field. Under the upper cloister, a procession of seminarians and priests solemnly marches toward the altar. Bishop Walsh, Superior General of Mary Knoll, gives them his parting message. You go to bring Christ and Christ to crucify. You are to preach him crucified. You are to express to others his life by your life. So from the beginning, he set his sights on Asia because it was a non-Christian population. And specifically, he set his sights on China. And that was his dream from the beginning, that the United States would send a mission to China and that we would contribute to the evangelization of Asia and of the world. So that not only were we receiving people who were proclaiming the gospel, but we were also sending them. It was a big change. It was a big change for the church here. And it was made at a moment that was appropriate. Over 450 million Chinese know not God. In all China, there are only two and a half million Catholics. The milling crowd startles the missioner with a gigantic problem of converting the rest. The small number of missioners have a task that is overwhelming. The harvest is there, but the laborers are needed. More volunteers must go out to them. Once Bishop Walsh and Father Price came together to form Marinol, um, they went out and looked for students. They looked for people to participate, and the first student was Francis Xavier Ford. Marinol was founded in 1911. The students arrived in 1912, and the first group wasn't able to be sent until 1918. They went out to China um, to basically begin to start Marinol's mission around the world. Some priests have to care for more than 50 villages. His people see their pastor only three times a year. Priests are few, too few. The Lord waits for more volunteers. After a seven mile walk, he comes to a Catholic village. When they got to China, the first, the first task was to, find, to actually find where they would live. There was no church, no parish, no gathering of people, no Christians. So their first task was to reach out to the community. At daybreak, the bell is rung for mass. Mass is offered in the largest room of the house. The wooden sawhorses used last night under the missioner's bed are now set up on end for a temporary altar. A door is brought for the altar table. All the needs for mass brought to the missioner's baggage are now arranged on the altar. Our Lord must love to come down again in these bare homes of the poor since it was a stable at Bethlehem, which he chose for his first coming. Mass is the same in the great cathedrals or in the mud-walled homes. It makes the Catholics all one, souls redeemed by our Lord. Here in a remote village of China's interior is a boy reared and schooled in America. 
He has learned a new life and a new language to teach Christ crucified to these people. Bishop Ford, he was totally convinced of the need for native-born police. He felt that the church needed to be totally planted in the culture of China. It wasn't something that we could just bring in from the outside. So yes, missionaries did go in, but in sharing the gospel, the next step is for people, Chinese people, to take that, make it their own, and share it among themselves and with their own, and then eventually to make a contribution to the universal church. So he was totally convinced. His, all of his efforts went into calling for vocations, asking for vocations, animating vocations, and then helping them be trained. Bishop Ford, when he was named Bishop of Keying, had the intuition that the best way to proclaim the gospel in China was to work with the women. The women were responsible for chaining the children. The women were responsible for the family. It was very difficult for men to be working with the women. Also in uh, the Hakka-speaking region of uh, Meishan, or Kaiying as it was called at the time, uh, a lot of the, a large group of women there were basically without men. They were uh, uh, effectively a small group of, uh, actually a growing group of women whose husbands and uh, other male family members had taken off to go find work, to send money home. So you had this unique situation, which was ideal for an approach with uh, women religious. And plus the services they were offering were in particular need chiefly uh, medical and educational. One of the most important missionary works is the training of native sisters. For the first time at Kong Moon, South China, there is held first profession for five sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, who have been educated and trained under the guidance of the Mary Knoll sisters. They will be invaluable workers among their own people. He had the insight of bringing the Marinol sisters over and asking them to go out two by two into the countryside to work with the women and to work with them all over. And that was extremely successful. It was the first time that sisters had been asked to evangelize in that way. Before that, they were always kind of kept or asked to stay in institutions, whether they were schools or hospitals or orphanages. But he asked them to go out, to go out to the villages, to be with the other women and to work with them. And that left some very lasting results for the church in China. To reach and teach the scattered families, the sisters make long journeys on foot and sometimes are away for days with only a native catechist as companion. But when the women and children come to them with confidence, then do they know the joy as well as the burden of him who said, come to me all. Or it would be you'd set up a Catholic enclave and then you'd bring the sisters and they'd stay in the school and that or the infirmary or whatever. It was such a horribly poor country. Anything you did was met with uh, gratitude by the people, the people that we serve. We didn't go there for the rich. I think the church benefited all over the world because of it. The sisters were able to be more, more active uh, in direct evangelization. It is the Christmas feast at Ping Nam. Crowds are coming out of church. Catholics from distances up to 40 miles have come on foot to attend the mass. Five years ago, this district had less than 200 converts. Now there are over 3,000 Catholics. Firecrackers make every feast complete, and the people set them off to honor the day. The star there reminds our converts of how the wise men were guided to God at Bethlehem. In 1935, uh, Father uh, Harry Bush was, was captured by some local bandits. Bandits often wait along mountain roads to kidnap and hold the missioner for ransom. The bandits got the idea that they could sell him to the communists. We walked along the mountain path. There appeared suddenly a group of bandits. They seized and bound us about the arms and neck, the rope. That evening, they sold us to the Reds for $300. During the seven weeks' captivity, we changed our location no less than 15 times. Fortunately, they were able to take advantage of the somewhat chaotic political system at the time and uh, invoke the aid of the State Department 
and a few other things who put pressure on the national, nationalist government to uh, send out the troops who went out in considerable force and basically boxed the bandits in until they were forced to uh, yield up uh, Father Bush. This was viewed very popularly by the people who were also plagued by the same, you know, roving criminals. Fortunately, though, as uh, later came out, he had paperwork of letters going back and forth between the uh, consulate and himself and the letterhead on the, uh, from the U.S. Uh, consulate was uh, prominent. Bishop Ford had, had voluminous correspondence with uh, both Marinol superiors and in the case of uh, Father Harry Bush's kidnapping with the, uh, the local consul and through them with the State Department. Once the communists were beginning to take over, Bishop Ford was very wise to tell all missionaries to uh, you know, clean out their files of anything that could be misunderstood. Uh, nobody had anything, uh, uh, any actual uh, spying activity. We were all there as missionaries, but anything that could be misconstrued to get rid of it. The big question is why he didn't do that with his own files. Did he feel somehow the bishop's office would, would be sacrosanct even to the communists? We don't know, but it was a big mistake. When uh, the communists took over his compound, they found all his papers, they found uh, letters in which he talked about resisting the, uh, the communists' uh, inroads and, over, and uh, attempts to control religion in, uh, in China, and as well as his correspondence with the State Department. That, that basically marked him. In his defense, um you, do, you also want to keep a good historical record of, of the mission. Uh, no one really believed that the communists would rise to the level of power they had. And uh, one has to admire Bishop Ford and other missionaries who stayed after all the foreign uh, governments and foreign businesses had left. So they, they turned tail and left. Uh, as soon as they had the first hint of danger, but the missionaries stayed behind. It was a time of a lot of mistrust and a time of a lot of suspicion on everyone's part. And I think many of the missionaries got caught in the middle of that. So the first thing that happened when the government took over was uh, a move to expel missionaries. Uh, and many of the missionaries were expelled down to Hong Kong uh, and out of China. That was a process that went on for quite a while. Bishop Ford uh, was not too anxious to leave. He stayed with his people, he stayed with the diocese, he stayed with his flock. Bishop Ford was a, was a, a missionary and he was uh, you know, devoted to his people and the notion of uh, abandoning them at that time you know, of persecution was simply unthinkable. While his family members would no doubt have wanted him to remain here, they were aware that things were getting hot in China. But I'm sure that uh, Marinol, given the, uh, the, the mis mystique, the aura that sounds, surrounds the notion, the whole idea of martyrdom, of bearing witness even unto death, they could not have persuaded him not to return. I only saw Bishop Ford once. That was after World War II, I was 12 years old. My grandparents lived at 462 8th Street, and the bishop's older sister and brother, Una Ford and Patty Ford, lived on the top floor of my grandparents' house. So I knew them quite well. They always spent the holiday dinners downstairs with us. And sometimes when we would visit, they would come down also. And I grew up knowing them. So when the bishop came home, he came to visit his brother and sister. And we got word that we should be there that morning. They were sitting around in the dining room chairs at the head of the table near the street side of the dining room. One of the men, started asking questions, and others picked up on it. 
um, what are you going to be doing now? Um, do, they, do they maybe have a position for you in Marinol somewhere? Isn't it getting, getting awfully dangerous back there? Surely they're not sending you back. And he calmed everyone down. And very quietly, he spoke patiently with, to them. He said, they are not sending me back. They have given me a choice of staying here or going back. It, it was my choice. I have to go back. My people need me there. And the room went absolutely silent. It was icy silent. You, it was like you would shiver. Everyone was so stunned that he was going back. He knew exactly what he was going back to. He knew better than anyone what he was going back to, and he chose to go back. Bishop Ford's first interest was to proclaim the gospel, to live the gospel, and to help the church grow in China. Uh, he was a US citizen, and that ultimately led to house arrest, led to be taken to prison and tried as a spy, uh, and led to his death in jail in China. I don't remember specifically if he expected to be arrested, but when it happened, he was uh, arrested, bound, marched through the streets, he and, uh, and a marital sister, convicted in a trial who, that we don't have any record of, so we don't have a transcript of it. Uh, we do know that he was convicted of espionage. After the trial, he was taken away, taken off to prison, but not directly, it was a long, ride and march through different villages. Uh, when they would arrive at a village, he would walk through it. The communists would whip up fervor against him. One time he was being beaten so badly that the guards ran off, his own guards. Sure, it was a very difficult experience for someone who went to give his life and to proclaim the gospel in China to be declared a spy and to be declared a convict, to be declared as someone uh, not wanted. Bishop Ford completed his long journey to the prison camp and was uh, there with Sister Pauline, the, the men, of course, on one side of the prison, the women on the other. Uh, thanks be to God, though, Sister Pauline, uh, his secretary, uh, could look through a slat sometimes on her side of the prison and see Bishop Ford. But she saw him get progressively weaker. The very last time she saw him, he was so sick that he couldn't move. And she saw another, a fellow prisoner, a Chinese man of some strength, let's say. He just picked him up and threw him over his shoulder and took him to wherever he was going. And that was the last time she saw him. Don't know specifically how he was treated but we, do, we, we don't know if he was tortured or anything like that. Uh, we have no reason to think he was, necessarily, but we do know he was neglected, and the last image anyone has, the last recorded um, observation of Bishop Ford, he was being carried, and he had lost a great deal of weight. He was clearly in a bad way, and he died shortly thereafter. You have asked for this interview, obviously, yeah. you know, that uh, we don't reveal your real identity. Could you explain to us a little bit why that, uh, why that is? We want to protect the young seminarians because the seminarians within the underground church, the government doesn't know about them. Those who are in the underground church went into hiding. In my particular region, they didn't come out of hiding until 10 years ago because they were living with families. They were fearful of being arrested and persecuted. Unfortunately, in China... We don't know too much about Bishop Ford, even within the Chinese Catholic community, unless you are part of what we call Lo Chao Wao. I was the first foreign missionary in this particular region in 70 years. These families were there when, at a young age, they saw the foreign missionaries exiled, murdered. 
I remember taking a Chinese seminary just recently to the Passionist Monastery. In the Passionist Monastery here in the diocese, there are memorials and graves of missionaries that were in China who were tortured and martyred. I remember seeing one memorial for the first Chinese priest in Yoanding. I took this Chinese seminary over there, and I showed him the grave. And he said, were they really tortured? And I said, yes. A lot of our priests were tortured and murdered. And he said, we don't know about this history in China. The loss of Bishop Ford, his, his death, we view as a type of uh, seed of martyrdom from which the faith grows. I think it's a great example for all of us uh, in terms of what mission is about, of what our faith is about. And especially, I'd say today, with the call from Pope Francis that the church needs to go out, needs to go out beyond our own borders to serve others, to help God's presence be more obvious in the world. I think Bishop Ford is a great example for that. So the question arises, was he really a martyr? We don't have witnesses of, uh, you know, him being crucified or shot or, uh, you know, the violent way most martyrs die. I think the word in Latin we use is uh, odium fidei, the, uh, because of hatred or contempt of the faith, the person died. The government says he died because he was a spy, uh, but the church views that he died because he was a missionary there in China who did not abandon his people, and it was not only his uh, supposed relationship to the U.S. government, it was his, um, his faithfulness that kept him there, and he died because of it, so uh, the church considers him uh, a martyr. Oh, I definitely consider him a martyr for the faith. He was the first one who, if it wasn't the communist who took over the region, he would have given the diocese back to the native clergy, which is something quite radical for back then. His legacy is really his love for China. I definitely believe he is a saint and a great and holy man. The question is always asked of people who knew him, um, did the man live heroic virtue? So we all try to live virtue. We all try to be loving, forgiving, uh, generous, uh, and on and on. Everything I've read and learned about him, uh, I would say, yes, I really think he was a man of great virtue lived a saintly life. I really think he will become a saint someday. How soon, I don't know, but he was definitely saintly and certainly martyred. We consider Bishop Ford and a number of other Marian Oilers who died proclaiming the gospel as martyrs. Mm -hmm. And I believe, I believe at one point that will probably be confirmed. Uh, by the Vatican. Mm -hmm.